Shalom. Shalom. And welcome to Brit Am Messianic Synagogue. If this happens to be your first time here with us, uh, if you'd raise your hand, we'd like to get you some information about our synagogue, uh, tell you a little about what's going on. I, I definitely want to welcome the Baptists from Navarre sitting in the way back row there. It's good to have you guys with us. That was... They're, they're, they're actually not Baptists, they're just behaving like Baptists tonight by sitting in the back. And we're glad that they're here, we're glad you're here. This is going to be a unique service for those that are, have visited when it's a regular Shabbat. This is Yom Kippur, it's the Day of Atonement. And so we're, service is going to be a little different, there's going to be a little more readings going on, there's going to be more standing up and sitting down than a normal Shabbat. Uh, and, and that'll go on. You'll also notice that many of the people are wearing white clothes. That is a tradition. If you're not wearing white clothes, please don't feel bad. Uh, it is a tradition and a custom, uh, but it's not something that is required by Scripture to do. But it gets our minds and our hearts connected with the symbolism of the Day of, the Day of Atonement when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies just one time a year. And when he went into the Holy of Holies, contrary to popular teaching in, in uh, much of the Christian community, uh, he wore only the white linen garments when he went into the Holy of Holies. Uh, he would wear all the garments to do his, his uh, regular work, and then he would just be wearing the white linen garments. He was not wearing the breastplate. He was not wearing the outer robe. He was not wearing the bells and pomegranates. And he did not have a rope tied around his leg so that if the sacrifice wasn't accepted, he could be dragged out. I remember when I, uh, I was raised in an in a Orthodox home and in a, in a conservative home, and, and uh, so Yom Kippur was 21 hours of prayers and meditation and, and uh, a lot of solemnness and sorrowfulness and, and beating your chest in repentance. And, and we'll do some of that tonight. Some of you will need to do more than others, but, but we'll, we'll be involved in that as it goes on through the service tonight and tomorrow. Uh, but when I came into faith in Yeshua, I happened to come to faith in a church environment, and the pastor in the church got very excited about this, this whole theme of the high priest going in with bells and pomegranates and that if the bells stopped ringing, they knew that he was dead. And so they would drag his body out by the rope that was tied around his leg. Now that's all just made up. It makes for good sermons if you don't care about accuracy or what the Bible actually tells us. But uh, So the reason we're wearing white is because it's kind of a symbolic connection to the high priest of old who would only wear the white linen garments and the high priest of our hearts, Yeshua, who, after the order of Melchizedek, served the role of high priest, and that's why when we wear the white, it's a symbol of that connection to that on this day. Amen? Amen. So if everyone will rise. Avinu Shabbat Shemaim, our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together on this appointed time. Father, this is a day that you chose for your people to gather together. It's not a suggestion, but it's a commandment. It's in your word, and it wasn't for just times of old, but it is for today. Father, it is an eternal and everlasting commandment. Father, we're not doing this, though, just because we've been commanded to do it or, or out of an obligation to you. We're doing it because our hearts draw us into your presence, and we're meeting you on this appointed time, in this unique way, in this sacred space and time. Abba, we ask that you'll help us to turn our hearts toward you during this time. Father, that uh, we will understand what true repentance, teshuvah, is, and that we'll use this opportunity to make sure that our hearts are right between us and you. Father, we know that your word says that if we ask you to forgive, you're faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we know that we may have entered here with imperfections, but we can leave here perfect and new because of what your word promises us through Yeshua. 
Abba, we ask that you'll help us as we read these words tonight, as we say these prayers, as we sing these ancient melodies together, that they would not just be following along and, and just going along with the crowd, but that each and every word would be spoken with kavanah, with intentionality and, uh, and realness from deep within us. And we thank you for all of this, B'Shem Yeshua Meshekenu. Amen. Amen. Still not loaded? But it's what? You can do that. I want to let you know that in ancient Israel, they never had problems with computers. <laughs> but we're, we're going to get that taken care of. I also want to say one thing. Joe is going to can't... Kol Nidre tonight. Kol Nidre is a prayer that uh, is named all vows. And unfortunately, because many people don't bother to understand things, uh, there is a move among some people to use the Kol Nidre to say that Jewish people can say things, make vows, make commitments, make contracts, and then just at the end of the year, say, or at the beginning of the year, say, Lord, forgive me and release me from all the contracts and things I'm going to make over the next year. Because Kol Nidre actually says, Abba, Father, forgive me for any vows that I make this year. But understand that this prayer was written in ancient times specifically to cover those that were forced into conversion those that were at knife point, at sword point, at threat of death, told that they had to become a Catholic or a Christian in order to stay alive. And so there were many Jewish people who chose to outwardly proclaim that faith, but inwardly remain Jewish. And believe it or not, there are still remnants of those people in our nation today, and I was sharing uh, recently uh, that my children, and you guys can sit for a minute while they're getting this together. I'm sorry. My children, uh, my sons, I guess I shouldn't call them children anymore. They're grown and have families. But my son's uh, wives, my son's married sisters, not theirs, but, but sisters. And now it's loaded? Okay. Uh, but their father was raised in a community in Ottumwa, Iowa, where his family would worship in the basement of the haberdashery on Shabbat in synagogue on Saturday, but on Sunday they would go to the Methodist church to participate outwardly as Methodists. Now this is post-World War II when there was a lot of negative feeling and fear, negative feeling towards Jews and fear among Jews. And so uh, rabbi Paul, who's now a rabbi, uh, was raised in that environment, and then his parents unfortunately split, and he ended up going with his mom, and they just continued going to a Methodist church apart from uh, being going to synagogue and practicing Judaism. And then through, I don't call them coincidences, through God-arranged moments in time, uh, Paul's wife started working for me. Uh, somehow they, we connected and our children started to connect and we invited them to come to synagogue. And Paul came to synagogue and started hearing the liturgy being sung in the synagogue and remembered the prayers and started singing the prayers along with the congregation from memory. And then he called his dad and he said, Hey, dad, are we Jewish? And his dad said, Who told you? And so there's still that kind of environment that's out there. So when we sing Kol Nidre tonight, when Joe cants it, and when we read the words in English, I want you to understand this is not a way to manipulate situations or to violate the Torah. The Torah commands us to keep our vows, to, to stand behind what we say, and, and that our words are our bond. And, and so this is not a way for Jewish people to say, I'm going to say this prayer and then I can violate my word for the whole year because I'm covered because I said this prayer. But this is a way to remind us 
of what our people have gone through for thousands of years of persecution and how many times our people have been forced into positions where we had to, uh, at the risk of life, uh, proclaim outwardly something that we didn't believe inwardly. And because of that, this prayer was set into place so that anybody who was forced to make a vow to a false religion would not feel like they were violating the Torah and separated from God because of that action. You're first, right? Call Nidre's first, right? Gotcha. Shabbat Shalom. Please join me in Matovu. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling places, O Israel. O Lord, through your abundant kindness, I will enter your house. In awe, I will bow down toward your holy sanctuary. O Lord, I love the house where you dwell and the place where your glory resides. I shall prostrate myself and bow and bend the knee before the Lord, my maker. As for me, may my prayers to you, O Lord, be at the right time. O oh God, in your abundant righteousness, answer me with the truth of your salvation. Matovu, o halecha Yaakov, Father of mercy, I come humbly before you this atonement eve. I confess that I have sinned much this past year, both against others and against you. At times I have rejected your counsel. Forgive me. Let these people not be ashamed because of me. May my sin not be held against my children or future generations. Judge me not according to my own righteousness, but according to the righteousness of my high priest, Yeshua, who made atonement for me with his blood, which he shed for my salvation. I lift up my eyes to you. Help me lead these people whom you have placed under my leadership. As I come to you daily, draw me into ever-increasing intimacy with you. Show me your paths. Let me hear your voice. Teach me your ways. And may I lead this flock ever closer to you. 
Let me boldly proclaim your salvation. Give me courage, great strength, and keep showing me how to build up my faith. You alone are my rock, my hope, and my deliverer. You are my salvation. Join me in the Shehechianu. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Shehechianu, Vekiyamanu, Vehegiyanu, Lazman Hazeh, Amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us life, sustained us, and brought us to this season. Amen. Leviticus 23, 27, and 28. However, the tenth day of this seventh month is Yom Kippur, a holy convocation to you. So you are to afflict yourselves. You are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. You are not to do any kind of work on that set day, for it is Yom Kippur to make atonement for you before Adonai your God. Leviticus 26, 40 and 42. But if they confess their iniquity and that of their fathers in the treachery they committed against me and how they walked contrary to me, in return I walked contrary to them and brought them into the land of their enemies. And if at that time their uncircumcised heart becomes humbled so that they accept the punishment for their iniquity, then I will remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham, and I will remember the land. Isaiah 43, 25 and 26. I, I am the one who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and will not remember your sins. Remind me when we argue our case together. State your case so you may be proved right. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Sharin, 
All vows, bonds, promises, obligations, and oaths between ourselves and God, which we have sworn and taken upon ourselves from last Yom HaKippurim. To this day of atonements, may God work them together for good as we repent of having made them. Yeshua said to us, Do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, as it is the city of the great king. But let your yes be yes, and your no be no, for whatsoever is more than these is from the evil one. The Lord is king, the Lord was king, the Lord shall be king forever and ever. Amen. Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, Adonai Imloch, Leolam Vahed. Our God and God of our fathers, the kingdom of God is within us. We declare that Yeshua, he is king, and his kingdom shall rule in our lives. Of him it was written, this is Yeshua, the king of the Jews. With love and devotion we will follow him and keep his commandments. We will love you with all our heart, soul, and strength, and we will love our neighbor as ourselves. We will bring the good news of salvation to all who will receive it, for you are coming again with judgment, and in that day all the earth shall know that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Baruch et Adonai HaMevorach For the kingdom belongs to Adonai, and he rules over the nations. Thus says Adonai, Israel's king and his redeemer, Adonai Sevot, I am the first and the last, and there is no God besides me. Who is this king of glory? Adonai, strong and mighty, Adonai, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai, Sevaot, he is the King of glory, Selah. King of the universe, let your kingdom be established in us. We acknowledge your rulership, not only with our lips, but also with our lives. The pardon for our sins has been provided for us by the atoning work of the shed blood of our Messiah, Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has given us the way of salvation in Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. Baruch Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu ederech ha-Yeshua, the Mashiach Yeshua. Amen. He is, 
He is Lord. He is Lord. Yeshua HaMashiach, He is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Yeshua HaMashiach, He is Lord. And you're already standing for the Shema. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kevod Malchuto Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is the name of his glorious kingdom for all eternity. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children. And speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elohecha bechol levavcha u'bechol nafshecha u'bechol meodecha Ve'hayu hadevarim ha'ele asher anochi metzavcha hayom alevavecha v'shinan tam levenecha v'dibar tabam b'shivtcha bevetecha uvlechtecha v'derech uv'shav pecha uv'komecha uksar tam leyot al yadecha v'hayu letotefot benenecha. Uchtav taham al mezuzot betecha uvisharecha vehavta larecha kamocha. Mi kamocha. Mi kamocha ba. Give thanks to the Lord, He is good. 
shores. Give thanks to the Lord, he is good. His mercy forever endures. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, he is good. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Give thanks to the Lord, he is good. Amen. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai, strong and mighty. Adonai, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, you everlasting doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? Adonai, Sevaot. He is the King of glory. Selah. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praises. Adonai tzvatai tiftach ufi yagi tehilatecha. Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the righteousness of the fathers, and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. O King, helper. Oh. Oh. You have, excuse me, I'm so door heavy. <laughs> you have remembered us unto life, O King who delights in life, and you have written us in the book of life. For your sake, O God of life, we rejoice that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. O King, Helper, Savior, and Shield, blessed are you, O Lord, Shield of Abraham. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu, Velohe avoteinu, Elohe Avraham, Elohe Yitzach, Ve'elohe Yaakov, Ha'el Hagedol Hagibor Ve'anora, El El Yom, Gomel Chasadim Tovim, Ve'chonei Ha'kol, Ve'zocher Chasdei Avot, Umevi Goel Libnei Vneheim, Leman shemo be'ahava, melech ozer hu mashiach hu magen. Baruch atah Adonai, magen Avraham. You, O Lord, are mighty forever. You raise the dead. You are mighty to save. You sustain the living with grace. Resurrect the dead with abundant mercy. Uphold the falling, heal the sick, set free those in bondage, and keep faith with those that sleep in the dust. Who is like you, master of mighty deeds? And who can compare to you, king who causes death and restores life and makes salvation sprout? And you are faithful to resurrect the dead. Blessed are you, O Lord, who resurrects the dead. Atagi bor leolam Adonai, Mechaye meti matarav lehoshia, Mechal kel chayim bechesed, Mechaye metim berachamim rabim, So mechro flim verofe kolim, Umatir asurim. Um chayem imunato lishene afar mi chamo chabal kevurot umido melach melech memit um chaye umat miach yeshua vene manat halechayot metim. 
Baruch ata Adonai mechaye hametim. You are holy and awesome is your name, and there is no God besides you. As it is written, the Lord of hosts is exalted through justice, and the holy God is sanctified through righteousness. Blessed are you, O Lord, the holy King. And at this time we will read the al -Khait. And these are the confessions of sins um, as a nation, as a whole. And it is custom yes. as we is it as we we repent of these to beat our chests to beat our hearts is a way of physically signifying that we are driving this into our souls into our hearts that we are repenting from these things we say yes amen for the sin we have committed against you willingly or under compulsion and for the sin we have committed against you by hardening our hearts for the sin we have committed against you by acting without thinking and for the sin we have committed against you by speaking perversely. For the sin we have committed against you through sexual impurity. And for the sin we have committed against you secretly and openly. For the sin we have committed against you knowingly and deceitfully. And for the sin we have committed against you by offensive speech. For the sin we have committed against you by wronging our neighbor. And for the sin we have committed against you by sinful meditation of the heart. For the sin we have committed against you by lewd association, and for the sin we have committed against you by insincere confession. For the sin we have committed against you by spurning parents and teachers. For the sin we have committed against you in presumption or in error. For the sin we have committed against you by violence, and for the sin we have committed against you by profaning your name. For the sin we have committed against you by unclean speech. For the sin we have committed against you by foolish talk. For the sin we have committed against you through the evil inclination. And for the sin we have committed against you knowingly and unknowingly. For all these sins, O oh God of forgiveness, forgive us and pardon us in Yeshua's name. Amen. For the sin we have committed against you by denying and lying. And for the sin we have committed against you by bribery. For the sin we have committed against you by scoffing. For the sin we have committed against you by slander. For the sin we have committed against you in our business dealings. And for the sin we have committed against you in eating and drinking. For the sin we have committed against you by demanding usurious interest. And for the sin we have committed against you by arrogance and pride. For the sin we have committed against you by speaking gossip. For the sin we have committed against you by wanton glances. For the sin we have committed against you with haughty eyes. And for the sin we have committed against you by insolence. For all these sins, O God of forgiveness, forgive us and pardon us in Yeshua's name. For the sin we have committed against you by rejecting responsibility. For the sin we have committed against you by contentiousness. For the sin we have committed against you by ensnaring our neighbor. And for the sin we have committed against you by envy. For the sin we have committed against you by levity. And for the sin we have committed against you by being stiff-necked. For the sin we have committed against you by running to do evil. For the sin we have committed against you by tail-bearing. For the sin we have committed against you by vain oaths. And for the sin we have committed against you by hatred without a cause. For the sin we have committed against you by breach of trust. And for the sin we have committed against you with confusion of mind. For all these sins, O God of forgiveness, forgive us and pardon us in Yeshua's name. We have trespassed, we have dealt deceitfully, we have stolen, and we have slandered. We have acted perversely, and we have done wrong. We have acted presumptuously, and we have been violent. We have spoken lies, we have spoken evil, we have spoken falsely, and we have blasphemed. 
We have scoffed, we have rebelled, we have provoked, and we have oppressed. We have been stiff-necked, we have corrupted, we have gone astray, and we have led others astray. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You, go home. you may be seated. seated. This is a video um, Greg Silverman, Paul Wilbur, and Joshua Aaron produced for Avino Malcano. Please stand. Join us in Avino Malcano. Our Father, our King, be merciful and answer us. Though we have no worthy deeds, treat us charitably with loving kindness, for you have saved us. Our Father, our Father, our King, our Father, our Father, our King, we pray for your grace, for Israel, your people, and that you would grant unto us forgiveness for our sins, pardon for transgressions. Our deeds cannot save us, and we are not righteous except by the blood of the Lamb. Our deeds cannot save us, and we are not righteous except by the blood of the Lamb. Our Father, our Father, our King, our Father, our Father, our King. 
We pray for your grace, for Israel, your people, that they would come to know you. Our hearts are turned toward you in love and reverence. We pray Israel will see in her darkness he who has died for her sins. We pray Israel will see in her darkness he who has died for her sins. Our Father, our King, there is no God but you. Have mercy on Israel. Deliver her from your distress, for her distress, and bring her to faith in Messiah Yeshua. Our Father, sound the shofar for the deliverance of your people, and let every knee bow and every tongue confess that Yeshua is Lord. Our Father, our King, bring peace to the earth through the Star Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Messiah Yeshua. Our Father, our King, sound the shofar for the resurrection from the dead and the heralding of Yeshua's return. Our Father, our King, let your spirit be poured out in end-time revival and let the harvest be gathered with the remnant of Israel coming to salvation. Our Father, our King, let your judgments fall on the unrepentant and deliver us from the schemes of our enemies. Our Father, our King, send us not away empty-handed from your presence. You may be seated. Our God and God of our fathers, you have given us this day as a time to examine and judge ourselves to joyfully bring harvest offerings to you and to look forward to Messiah's return. We remember Yeshua, our great high priest, who brought his own precious blood, the blood of atonement, into your most holy place. Through his blood, which cleanses us from sin, we now have our consciences purified from, sin, from guilt and condemnation and can serve you in love with pure devotion. You will bring this age to a close with a shofar call, heralding a new age. Then nations shall learn war no more. The wolf and the lamb shall lay down together in peace, and your name shall be one over all the earth. In that day, Israel shall be delivered and dwell in peace, and all the nations shall come to your light. The new Jerusalem and the new temple will be established with priests and Levites from among all peoples. And from one new moon to another, from one Shabbat to another, and on all the appointed seasons of Sukkot, all flesh shall come to worship before you. We dedicate ourselves to you today for your purposes as living sacrifices. We consecrate ourselves to you, and we seek your will. Wherever you want us to go, we will go. Whatever you want us to do, we will do. And whatever you want us to say, we will say. If there is anything you want us to change, show us, and we will do it. We seek you and desire your anointing, your manifest presence that breaks every yoke. Let it rest upon us, and we will be victorious. Please follow along silently. You may stand.
Amen. Please read us, read along with us in the Psalms. Bless Adonai, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless Adonai, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. He forgives all your iniquity. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with loving kindness and compassions. Magnified and sanctified be his great name in the world, which he has created according to his will. May he establish his kingdom during your life and during your days and during the life of the whole house of Israel, even swiftly and soon, and say, Amen. Let his great name be blessed forever and to all eternity. Blessed, praised, and glorified, exalted, extolled, and honored, magnified, and lauded be the name of the Holy One. Blessed is he. Though he be high above all the blessings and songs, praises and consolations which are uttered in the world, and say, Amen. May he who makes peace in his high places make peace upon us and upon all Israel, and say, Amen. Yit Kadav, Yit Kadash, Shme Raba, Ve Alma Divra Herute, Ve Yamlik Malkute, Ve Chaye Chon of Yome Chon, Uf Chaye de Kobe Israel, Bagala, Bagala, Uvisman Kariv. Vemru Amen. Yehesh me Rabba me Varach. Le Olam Lal me Almaya. Yit Barach. Yit Barach. Ve Yish Tabach. Ve Yit Pa'a. Ve Yit Roma. Ve Yit Nase. Ve Yit Hadar. Ve Yit Ale. Ve Yit Halal. Shme du Kurusha Brichu. Lela min kol birchata veshirata tush bechata vanechemata damiran beama vemru amen. Oh, se shalom bim romav. Hu ya se shalom ale. Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Ve'alko Yisrael, Yase Shalom, Yase Shalom, Shalom Aleinu, Ve'alko Yisrael. Amen. You may be seated for the message. Not working. There it is. I wanted to mention a couple of things before I get into the message. First, thank you all for being here tonight. It is a tremendous blessing to see all of you as we join together to be observant of this holy day. I also want to remind everybody that we have service tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock and uh, hope to see all of you there as well as Others and those online, thank you for joining us. I wanted to mention, I can't mention all of the people that I saw online, uh, but Rabbi Mike, Mark Guy is somewhere watching us. Jordan Marcelino from Israel, who's with the beautification, pro, uh, pro, they pick up trash all around the Sea of Galilee. 
It's an amazing ministry. They have people from the, all over the world come and help them clean up. He's also a terrific musician. Uh, the Atwells from up north somewhere, they used to be down here, now they moved up north. Ben Juster, who just moved from Israel back to the United States to head up to Coon, USA. John Kelly uh, and Amy Kelly, dear friends from up in Pennsylvania. The Grays from Louisiana. The Elliots, who are somewhere up near Dothan uh, area. So anyhow, there are a whole bunch of folks that watch online. If you're watching online, thank you for watching and being a part of our community by distance. Um, so I think that's all the announcements I need to make. Um, so I can close this. I want to go over a couple of things dealing with, oh, I forgot to say, if your kids are missing school and you need an excuse for Yom Kippur, not for all the other days, but just for Yom Kippur, we have a note here for you. So you can come get that after service. And uh, thank you to Joe, who did a tremendous job on the Kol Nidre. And also to Jonathan and Catherine uh, for helping out by leading the, uh, the service this morning so I didn't have to do all of it myself, which is a wonderful thing. So, amen. We're celebrating Yom Kippur tonight, the Day of Atonement. And I want to cover a couple of things. One is that in our... Uh, in the, the prayers that we said together, you know, for the sin of this, for the sin of that, for the sin of this, there's a couple of sins in there that I wanted to talk specifically about tonight. Uh, in reference to Yom Kippur, in reference to our faith as uh, Jewish people and non-Jewish people who follow a biblical Judaism that believes that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. So, one of those things is that we, we recited when we were pounding our chest, and we pound our chest, as Jonathan said, because our heart's there, and, and it pains our heart to realize that we have committed sin against our Heavenly Father, that we've, we've failed to walk the way we're supposed to. But one of those sins is presumption. And presumption is not a sin we talk about all that often, but in our faith, there are a lot of things that are presumed that become part of what we are that are not necessarily accurate or correct, but it becomes an assumption. Uh, this last month, I've watched as a number of people posted, uh, and, and listen, I'm going to try to be kind because it's Yom Kippur, but people post articles and things about Yom Kippur making statements that they're just regurgitating from other people who made statements without actually checking to see if those statements are true. One of those statements deals with what we do on Yom Kippur. Now, I already spoke a little bit at the early part of the service about why we wear white, and we wear white because it's a tradition that we do that's based upon Scripture, but that basing upon Scripture is so that we can symbolically do something to connect us with something we can't do anymore. In other words, there's no temple standing in Jerusalem. We don't have a high priest that's a physical man who's going and making sacrifices. He's not going once a year into the Holy of Holies. He's not applying the blood to the uh, Ark of the Covenant, none of that is happening. So we wear the white in a way of symbolically connecting to something that we can't do anymore in the physical. Uh, it's the same reason that we do the Amidah that we did or some of the other prayers that we do. It, it is kind of a symbolic replacement of temple worship, of things that our hearts desire to be a part of, but we can't be a part of anymore. So we do things symbolically to connect with that. Now, those symbolic things are not commandments. And it's really important that we understand that because there are people that put weight on symbolism that becomes a commandment. And when it becomes a commandment, it's actually violating a commandment because it's not a commandment God gave. Does that make sense? 
For instance, earlier tonight, as we began uh, the, the Shabbat of Yom Kippur, my wife lit the Shabbat candles. They're actually the Yom Kippur candles tonight, but it's two candles that she lit. One is for remember the Sabbath day, and Yom Kippur is a Sabbath day also, and one's for keep the Sabbath day. We're not only supposed to remember it, but we're supposed to shomer. We're supposed to guard it. We're supposed to make sure that it's part of what we do. Now, remember and keep the Sabbath day are commandments. They're actually written in the book. Lighting the candles are not a commandment. It's not written in the book. We can light the candles because it symbolically connects us to the commandment and what we're doing. But if we make lighting the candles a commandment, then we're actually violating the scripture. And that causes us to have problems. Okay, so our symbolic observances are, can be very positive. But if we make them equal to or greater than the commandments of God, then we violate the very text of the word that we proclaim to follow. So that's important. Symbolism is good. It's profitable. On Shabbat, we have our children follow the Torah around the sanctuary. So they're symbolically following the commandments of God. They're symbolically practicing in their mind that they're going to walk where the scriptures lead them. It's a symbolic thing. But if we don't do that one Shabbat, we're not all going to hell. Okay, because we're not violating a commandment we're not doing a symbol, okay? We're reading the scriptures, we're doing the things that are involved, we're just not doing the symbol with it. There are other things that I call practices. There's symbol, and then there's practices, and practices are things that are actually in the scripture that teach us how to observe the scripture, okay? So, for instance, on Yom Kippur, we are commanded to um, afflict our soul, to afflict our nefesh, to make ourselves miserable is how most people put that, but the actual terminology there just means to, to humble your soul and to place yourself secondary to God in all things, to to lower yourself in esteem and raise him up in esteem. Uh, And so that's what the word actually means. Uh, From that word, uh, people say we're supposed to fast on Yom Kippur. Now, let me say this, because this is what I've been reading. The Bible doesn't say to fast on Yom Kippur. It just says to afflict your soul. You don't have to fast to do that. And fasting, afflicting your soul is really just lowering yourself and humbling yourself and being, having humility, and so we don't have to fast. That's what they're saying, okay? So, but that's not what the text says. That's what this text says. But in order to understand how we practice our faith, we don't just look at one verse. There are a lot of people who base entire religions on one verse. If I were going to start my own religion... If, if I didn't believe that there was eternal consequences for that, and I was going to start my own religion, I would start it based upon the verse, wine makes the heart happy. I would take that one verse, and I would establish a religion for happy people. Right? But we can't do that. We can't take that one verse, because there's other verses that tell us not to be drunk. Right? So, so we have to put all of the verses together in order to come up with how we do things. So, there are people out there that are saying, the Bible doesn't teach us to fast on Yom Kippur. Well, it doesn't in Leviticus 23. However, if you actually read the rest of the Bible, which I encourage you to do, in Isaiah 58, it says this in verse 3, why have we fasted yet you don't see. Why have we afflicted our souls, yet you take no notice? The Bible connects afflicting our soul with fasting. Now, you might say, but Rabbi, that's just one verse. I know it's only one. So let me read another. Psalm 35, 13. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I afflicted my soul with fasting. 
my prayer kept returning to my heart. That's two verses. Listen, I promise you, I'm not going to go through the whole Bible tonight because I don't have time because this isn't even my message. But if you look, you'll find how the Scripture connects afflicting your soul or humbling yourself with fasting. It teaches us that when we humble ourselves, we should also fast. Why? Because starving the flesh allows for a strengthening of the spirit. The Bible teaches that also. So, I just wanted to make that clear. By the way, just in case that wasn't enough because that was Old Testament verses that I shared. And, you know, some folks are only New Testament people. In Acts 27, 9, by the time the book of Acts is written, chapter 27, verse 9, this is Luke writing about Paul. And it says this, Since considerable time had passed and the voyage was already dangerous because the fast had already gone by, Paul kept warning them. The fast is Yom Kippur. By the time the apostles are traveling, by the time Paul is traveling, Yom Kippur is called the fast. So unless Paul is wrong, and Luke is wrong, and the New Testament is wrong, and the Old Testament is wrong, I would conclude that fasting is part of how we observe Yom Kippur. Now let me say, as I say that, because I don't like to ever leave anybody feeling condemned, if I can avoid it. It's also unbiblical to fast if you can't. If you have a physical reason, like if you're a diabetic and you have to eat in order to keep your body operating, don't fast. Okay? If uh, you have medicine that you have to take, don't fast. If you are not an adult, you don't have to fast. That doesn't mean those of you who don't act like adults. Maybe fasting will assist you in that process. But don't feel condemned by what I'm saying. I'm just saying that there's a difference between a symbolic action that we do to connect us to something biblical and actually reading what the Scripture says that those in the Scripture practiced in order to do what they were doing. Yom Kippur is a day to afflict our souls, My sister, Randy, sent me a message today. It had uh, an ice cream truck, and on the side of the ice cream truck, it said liver and onions. And then it said, if year 2020 was an ice cream truck. And then she said on it, if you want to afflict your soul, here's how. So you can afflict your soul by doing other things also that are not comfortable to your flesh. Okay, on Yom Kippur, symbolically, these are not things we can look at and see in the Scripture. Symbolically, uh, we're taught not to take showers because taking a shower is thinking too much about how people think about you. You're not supposed to wear cologne or toilet water. Uh, You're not supposed to shave. You're not supposed to wear leather because in ancient times leather was something rich people had. Uh, You don't wear colorful clothing or jewelry or other things. Those things are not in the scripture that are given you don't do these things. Those are things that we added to to help us get our minds and our hearts on the Lord. But fasting is absolutely in the scripture. Now I want to talk about that, that was the first thing which was um, the sin of um, presumption. And the reason I say that's a sin of presumption is because the people that are writing those articles are presuming that not one Jewish person in all the history of the world since the Torah was given understood that that word for afflict your soul was different than the word sum, which is the word for fasting. That none of the people that actually read Hebrew, spoke Hebrew, wrote Hebrew, wrote the Bible itself, taught the Bible, none of the disciples, Yeshua, none of those people knew that those words were two different words but connected in how we do things. And so they presume they know better than everybody throughout history of all time. That's presumption. 
And we need to be careful about that. Listen, we need to be careful not only when we talk about other people presuming things, but we need to be careful about ourselves as Messianic believers presuming things or presuming we know things that, uh, that nobody else knows. Uh, we need to be careful how we do things. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about, my note, and this is the more serious topic, and this is blasphemy of the name of God. There was a, a section in the Alchet where we, for the sin of blasphemy of your name, for the, okay, and Understand when we talk about the name of God, we're not talking about the four-letter tetragrammaton, spelled yod Hey vav Hey in Hebrew, the name we don't pronounce, the name we don't say. We're not talking about that name, and I'm not even going to go into all of the stuff about that name. When the Bible talks about a name, it's talking about the character, nature, makeup, who it is. In other words, we used to say, Ed has a good name. That doesn't mean the name Ed is a good name, right? I mean, it may be. Ed, is Ed a good name? If you had an option, would you have chose something else? Okay, not anymore. But there was a time. It would have. But when we say Ed has a good name, we mean that he has a good reputation. We mean that he keeps his word. We mean that he's somebody you can depend on. We, he's got a good character. And when we talk about the name of God, we're talking about the character and nature of God. And so when we blaspheme the name of God, it's causing other people to see God as less than what He was or uh, as something He's not. And this is a serious problem among not necessarily the people in this room, but some people maybe in this room, but, but uh, about uh, uh, both people in the Christian world and people in the Jewish world. And so let me share what I mean about that. In the Christian world, the unchangeable God changed. About two-thirds through the book. He was the God of Israel and the Jewish people all the way up until we get to Malachi, Malachi, or Chronicles if you're reading a Jewish Bible. And then suddenly when you go past that blank page in the Bible, he's suddenly the God of the church and all the rules changed. He, he no longer expected people to keep feasts like Yom Kippur or Yom Teruah or Sukkot. He, he no longer expected people to keep kashrut or the health and food laws. He, he no longer expected people to keep Sabbath on Saturday. It now became Sunday. He no longer, you know, there's a whole list of things and I don't have to go through all of them. But in the Christian world, when you say God changed, but God's word said he's immutable and unchangeable, you're blaspheming the name of God. You're changing his character. You're sharing who he is in a way that's not who he is. Now let me say this. And, and You know, there's certain things nowadays we have to say before we say things or after we say things so that people don't think we're saying what we're not saying. Okay? None of what I just said has to do with whether we're redeemed or saved or not. Okay, our salvation, our redemption is not because we did something, it's because God did something. Okay, so I want to make that clear as we're doing it. What we're doing is we're teaching people about a God who's different from the God of the Bible. And in the Christian world, there's a lot of that that goes on. There's less and less, and I was so blessed yesterday... And the day before, by the return, if you haven't watched it, go on YouTube and watch the return as thousands, I think there was like 150,000 people gathered together in Washington to a service that was started by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn and had Paul Wilbur and Marty Getz and, and Joshua Aaron and others there. But you would not believe how many of the Christians that were involved were saying Yeshua, HaMashiach. And, and, st and it was interesting because some of them had not practiced before they got up there. 
but they did their best. And I was very proud of the people that God is bringing out of darkness into light. And, and I think that's for the case for all of us. I don't think it's, we just pick on one group of people. But understand that God is doing something in these last days, restoring things so that people will see the true character and nature of God. And the blindness that's caused by blaspheming His name in the Christian community is being lifted off so that more and more non-Jewish people, more and more people that were raised in the church are seeing the centrality of Israel in prophecy instead of the United States. They're seeing that you know Yeshua was actually Jewish and still is. That He walked a Torah observant life. That He didn't violate the commandments. That a lot of the things that they were taught are wrong and that God didn't change His mind two-thirds through the book. He didn't change His mind. He didn't change who He is. He didn't change any of that. So, blasphemy of the name of God in the church works that way. But I want to talk about something that affects me uh, and my, my family and people that are Jewish in this congregation uh, from a different perspective in that. I had my, my Uncle Abe passed away this week. Um, my Uncle Abe was my father's brother. Um, he was a, a, a sweet man that I grew up with when I was young. My family had a divorce between my mom and dad. We didn't get to see my Uncle Abe as much. We saw him some in the last few years, reconnected with his children. My fondest memory, someone asked me the other day, it, it, it's kind of strange, someone, I said, my Uncle Abe died, and they said, what was your fondest memory of him? It took me back. I couldn't really think of a fondest memory of my Uncle Abe. And then it, I, I remembered, it, my fondest memory was when my dad backed his station wagon over my Uncle Abe's VW. And, and my Uncle Abe came out yelling and screaming at my dad. I had never seen anybody scream at my dad. That, my fondest memory was my uncle screaming at my dad like my brothers and I screamed at each other. It was the first time in my life I realized adults are just larger children. And so my, my uncle came out and he said, you hit my car and, and I'll never forget my dad's words. He said, I thought it was the trash can, which I'm telling you didn't make it any better. But my, I, so my uncle died, but I don't know what his status and standing was with the Lord. And so uh, we've been praying for him, uh, uh, not him, his family. We've been praying for him for a while. We we uh, try to share as much as we can and do what we can, but, but I don't know his status. And here's what's even worse. I don't know that he knew his status with the Lord. And I want you to understand the very fact that the majority of Jewish people in the world today, from the first per time who's first time visiting a synagogue, they'd never been there before, they never opened the Bible in their life, they never read the first words of Genesis, they walked into a synagogue to the most prestigious rabbi in Israel. Not one of them will tell you that they're sure of where they're going when they die. Not one. And that's a result of blasphemy of His name. And I want to explain that tonight. In Judaism, and we, we read the prayers today, we read about it today, we know that once a year, the high priest would go and he would apply blood to the altar, uh, from the altar to the mercy seat, and sins were covered from one year to the next. That's what the Scripture teaches us. From one year to the next, and every year there had to be that accepted sacrifice in order for the sins of Israel to be covered from one year to the next. And God was very specific about this. He was not only specific about the day it would happen, He was specific about how it would happen, how the priest would dress, how the animals were slaughtered, what animal was slaughtered, what animal wasn't slaughtered, how it was done, all of it in specificity. There is a lot of information in the Bible that's given just about how to do this one sacrifice 
so that the sins of Israel would be covered from one year to the next. If you read the Bible, and you do, and you look at it, you would have to conclude that the nature of God and the character of God was concerned about the eternity of the people Israel. He provided the Torah to them so they'd have a way to, to know Him. They, 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 he met them on the mountain. He provided an escape from Egypt. He, he departed the waters so they could go into the promised land. He, miracle after miracle, sign after sign, He was involved with the people of Israel and He wanted them to have an eternal relationship with Him. Why do I know that? Because so many times in the Bible he says this is an eternal thing. This is not temporary. This is not just for now. This isn't going to go away. This is eternal. Yom Kippur is an eternal feast that we're supposed to celebrate and observe every year for eternity, forever. It's never supposed to end. Yet the Jewish people today, although they say prayers on Yom Kippur, Although they, they, they say the Alchet and the Ashamnu and they, they, they uh, repent for their sins, they have changed what God said to say that prayers and good works replace that sacrifice and that offering. They have changed God's word. There's not a word in the Bible that says prayer and good works replaces a Yom Kippur offering. It's not in Genesis, it's not in Exodus, it's not in Numbers, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, it's not in Joshua, it's not in any of the Old Testament books. There's not a book in the Bible that tells us that at some point in time, the sacrifices were going to stop and they were going to be replaced by good works and prayers. It's not there. In order for that to be there, God would have had to say it. He didn't say it. So the Israel, nation Israel, the Jewish people, have blasphemed the name of God by saying God didn't provide a provision or a means to cover sins for Israel. Because there's no sacrifice. Matter of fact, I had a, a Jewish friend who was debating with me about Yeshua, and I asked him specifically, I said, tell me, why they're not making Yom Kippur sacrifices in Israel right now. I said, listen, I'll go along with you. Before Israel was reformed, before they got Jerusalem, before uh, 1967, I, I'll allow that there had to be some mechanism for this to take place. If, if you don't believe in Yeshua, you can at least have the excuse we can't do it. It has to be done in Jerusalem. There have to be priests. It has to be there. We can't do it. God has to understand we have a heart's desire to do it, but it's not being done because we can't do it. But since 1967, there is no excuse. Well, we don't have a temple. Listen, there is absolutely no biblical requirement for there be a temple to make a sacrifice. How do we know that? Because Ezra and Nehemiah tell us that. They made sacrifices and then they built the temple. There's no requirement to have a temple to make a sacrifice. Well, why aren't they doing it? They're not doing it because the character and nature of God has been changed in their mind to where He no longer requires a sacrifice even though they are physically able to make one. I have family that don't believe in Yeshua that have absolutely no connection to the covering of atonement biblically. They have replaced the biblical with the traditional. And it's a horrible, horrible thing. Well, Rabbi Eric, if it's not supposed to be prayer and good works to replace the sacrifice, how were the sins of Israel covered from year to year since the destruction of the temple? Thankfully, the Talmud actually tells us. Now, I'm not a proponent of the Talmud in general, but the Talmud tells us 
that from the year Yeshua died on, the red cord that was tied upon the goat's head and on the temple door never turned white again. That from the year Yeshua died on until the destruction of the temple, which is some 30 years, the sacrifice of Yom Kippur was never accepted in the temple again, even though they were still making those sacrifices. And it's not just in one place. It's in two places in the Talmud, two different references to the fact that from the year he died on, the Yom Kippur sacrifice was never accepted again. And let me tell you why it was never accepted, because it wasn't needed. Because from the year he died on, he went and applied the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. He went out of time and fulfilled the need for sacrifice for all time. And we don't need to make that sacrifice anymore because it has been made. Once and for all. God didn't change His character. He fulfilled every bit of His character and provided a mechanism for a perfect sacrifice so that the yearly sacrifice wasn't needed anymore. Listen, I want to tell you something really important. Because it wasn't needed anymore didn't mean they didn't do it anymore. Understand they were obedient to the text of the Torah explicitly even though that offering was never accepted again. They didn't stop following the Torah because God had fulfilled the need for that atoning work. They continued to observe Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Pesach, all the feasts and festivals. How do we know that? Because Paul, I just said, he was on his way back to Israel so he could observe the feasts and festivals. He was a believer. Paul made sacrifices in the temple. He made Nazarite sacrifices in the temple, not only for himself, but for other people. They continued to observe the letter of the law from the heart through the anointing of the Ruach, all the way until the temple was destroyed. They didn't do it because they were waiting on anything anymore. They were doing it because it had been fulfilled. The book of John is one of my favorite books in the Bible. The book of John in the Brit Kadashah, John tells more intimacy details, more relational details than any of the other writers. I just love John's writing. But in John 8, it says this, so, he, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now the reason this is important is because we tend to, in Judaism, focus on Yom Kippur as the day of fasting and afflicting your souls and repenting and beating your chest and being sorry and sorrowful and solemn and all of those things are important. But we leave out the other half of Yom Kippur. The other half of Yom Kippur, if you read Leviticus 25, it says, you are to count off seven Shabbatot of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of seven Shabbatot is 49 years, and on the tenth day of the seventh month, that's Yom Kippur, you are to sound a shofar blast, you're to sound the shofar all throughout your land, you're to make the 50th year holy and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all the inhabitants. It is a jubilee to you when each of you is to return to his own property and each of you to return to his own family. That 50th year is your yovel, your jubilee. You are not to sow or reap that which grows by itself and gathers the untended vines. Since it is jubilee, it's to be holy to you. You will eat from its increase out of the field. It is a year of jubilee. Each of you will return to his property. And continues on. The second half of Yom Kippur is what we're living in now. The first half of Yom Kippur happened up until his death. When we were 
I was about how sorrowful we were. It was about repentance. It was about all that. But with his death, he applied the blood once and for all. And we were set free. And he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And if you want to understand more about this, keep reading down. Because it's in this chapter when Yeshua is arguing with the Pharisees. And about who Abraham is and their relationship. We're children of Abraham. We've never been slaves. It makes me laugh every time I read that verse. Judaism is based upon the fact that we were slaves in Egypt. God delivered us from Egypt. Brought us to Sinai. We wandered for 40 years. We got into the promised land. And here's a bunch of teachers telling Yeshua... We're Abraham's kids. We've never been slaves. It's our story. It's Passover. It's Sukkot. So he's having this discussion. This is right after. So if the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was thrilled. Then the Judean said to him, You're not even 50 years old and you've seen Abraham? And Yeshua answered, Amen, amen. I tell you, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham saw Yeshua's day and rejoiced because he knew the second half of Yom Kippur was going to be fulfilled and we'd be set free. And whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish, you're set free by the exact same action, by the atoning blood of Yeshua who once and for all set us free so we don't need to have a high priest who goes in first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people and makes a sacrifice anymore because it's been done once and for all. And when Jewish people teach anything else, they're changing the character of God. They're, they're saying, well, here God had this plan, but then He changed His mind. He said this was eternal, but it really wasn't. I don't want a God who has an eternal that really isn't. If He said the feasts and festivals were eternal, but we think they're all, eternal only means a little while, then eternity isn't eternal either. It's a problem of blasphemy of the name of God. It's a problem of changing the character of God as if He didn't know all this was going to happen. As if He didn't have a plan. As if the temple was destroyed and He didn't have a plan B. He didn't know what was going to happen. How are my people going to be atoned? There's no temple standing. What are they going to do? Oh, woe is me. God never woe is me's. He had a plan. And that plan was... That there was going to be a perfect sacrifice that atoned for our sins, a perfect high priest that didn't need any sacrifice for his own sins because he was the I Am. Robed in flesh dwelling among us. And his work is perfect. And his plan is perfect. And if we become part of that plan, we can become perfect. The scripture actually says, be perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. So we need to understand Yom Kippur. We need to understand God didn't change his mind with the church. He didn't say, oh, you know, the plan didn't work. I tried, but those hard-headed Jews wouldn't go along with it. So I'm going to come up with a new plan and, and go to the Romans and maybe they'll do it. And, and if they do it, then maybe some of the Jews will get jealous and come be a part of that. That isn't what he said. He didn't do that at all. He said, from Genesis to Revelation, I have one plan. The redemption of all Israel. That's my plan. And we need to kind of shake our brothers and sisters in the church world and say, hey, if you guys are saying God changed, you're blaspheming His character because He's unchangeable. We also need to shake our Jewish brothers and sisters, our family members, those that aren't believers yet in Yeshua, and say, look, I know what the rabbis say, but that's not what the Bible says. I know what the rabbis say, but that's not what Torah says. I know what the rabbis say, but that's not even what the historical documents of Judaism say. They say 
that there was a moment in time when atonement was provided once and for all, and never again was the sacrifice accepted as an atonement offering, even though the sacrifice was made faithfully till the temple was destroyed. And we need to be careful. I'm only given two examples on Yom Kippur, but there's a plethora of examples of ways that we as messianics, we as uh, those that, that come from a Christian background, we as those that come from a Jewish background, have by our language, by our actions, by our twisted understanding, by our presumptiveness, change the character of God to something other than who He is. And the only way you'll know what His character is, is to read His Word and believe what it says. You're not going to get it. And I'll tell you over and over, please, please, please do not accept anything I say just because I say it. Everything I said tonight, I want you to, if you haven't already done it, go and look. Look it up in, uh, on the interweb. They always tell the truth. No, look it up. Follow it up. Read in the Bible. See what it says. Don't accept anything just because I say it. Don't say anything because Rabbi Jonathan says it. Don't listen to anything because Catherine says it. Especially don't say anything, take anything that Leah says. Read the scripture. I love Leah. If I didn't, I wouldn't pick at her. You know, I said that once and someone said, Rabbi, you never pick on me. <laughs> to which I replied, you're right. <laughs> Listen. This is a serious topic. Blasphemy of God is a serious topic, and we need to be aware of it. We need to start, you know, while we're looking at our hearts and looking at what we've done, have we acted in a way that's contrary to how God would have us to act? Because if we say we're followers of His, disciples of Yeshua, then how we act is how people are going to think He would act. If we speak in a way that's not, if we live in a way that's not, if we do things that are contrary, if we teach things that are contrary, we're blaspheming the name of God. And Romans, speaking about the Jewish believers, dealing with the Gentile believers, said they were causing the Gentiles to blaspheme the name of God by their actions. In other words, the Jewish believers were acting in an untorah way and the Gentiles were looking at how they were, lived and how they acted and following their example. And they were causing them to live in a way that showed God to be something other than He was. Whether you're Jewish or not makes no difference. There's only one God. There's only one people of God. And how we act and how we live will either share with those around us the true and living God, or it will blaspheme His name. Let's all stand. As Jonathan and Catherine come back up, and you guys are going to have to look at that for the rest of the time because this just went black. Oh, it's back. Okay. And before we close with the Elenu and the Adon Alum and the Aaronic Benediction, I just want to take a moment and pray. And look, this is an ideal time. It is Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. It's a time our hearts and our minds should already be on repentance. And if anything that I shared today touched your heart, and more importantly, 
if the Ruach touched your heart, take this time to pray and ask Adonai to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Avinu Malkeno, our Father, our King. We just come together right now, standing before you knowing that in honest truth, every one of us have blasphemed your name this year. Every one of us have lived in a way that was less than what you would have us to do. And every one of us are your creation and your children and people made in your image and likeness. So, Father, I ask you to help us right now to just take some moments, some time, and just ask you to forgive us. And we know that you will. We just need to humble ourselves. We need to afflict our souls before you and ask for your forgiveness. And Abba, once we've asked for that forgiveness honestly from the sincerity of our heart, we need to lay those sins aside knowing that you have removed them and walk in newness, understanding that your word promises that. Father, we ask that you would draw us closer to you, that this next year we would walk closer and more aligned with you. Father, that we would not stumble and fall over things and, and cause others to see you in a way that's not as magnificent and wondrous as you truly are. And we ask all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. It is our duty to praise the master of all, to ascribe greatness to the author of creation. For he made us unlike the nations of the lands and has not placed us like the families of the earth. He has not made our portion like theirs and our lot like all their multitudes. And we bend the knee and bow and acknowledge our thanks before the king over kings, the holy one, blessed be he. He stretches out heaven and establishes earth's foundation. And the seat of his glory is in the heavens above, and the presence of his power is in the most exalted heights. He is our God, there is none other. True is our King, there is nothing beside him, as it is written in his Torah. And you shall know this day and take to your heart that the Lord, he is God, in the heavens above and on the earth below, there is none other. And it is said, the Lord shall be king over all the world. On that day, the Lord will be one, and his name one. none like our God. There is none like our Lord. There is none like our King. There is none like our Deliverer. 
Who is like our God? Who is like our Lord? Who is like our King? Who is like our Deliverer? Let us give thanks to our God. Let us give thanks to our Lord. Let us give thanks to our King. Let us give thanks to our Deliverer. Blessed be our God. Blessed be our Lord. Blessed be our King. Blessed be our Deliverer. You are our God. You are our Lord. You are our King. You are our Deliverer. You are he to whom our fathers offered before you the fragrant incense. Master of the universe, who reigned before any form was created, when creation came about by his will, then as king was his name proclaimed to be. And after all has ceased to be, he alone will reign in awesomeness. And he was, he is, and he shall be eternally in splendor. And he is first, there is no second, to compare to him, to be his equal, without beginning and without end. His is the power and dominion. He is my God, my living redeemer, and the rock of my pain. In times of trouble, and he is my banner, and a refuge for me, the portion of my cup in the day I call upon him. In his hands I entrust my spirit, in the time I sleep or am awake, and with my spirit, my body, the Lord is with me, I shall not fear. I don't I bless you and keep you. I don't I make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I don't I lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'shem Yeshua Meshikenu Sar Shalom, in the name of Yeshua our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. 
Remember service tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock.